Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey, everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor. And just yesterday, I was talking to my 14-year-old, and I was asking him what his baseball goals are. And this kind of illustrates a point having to do with Ripple and their IPO and the things you're seeing about their shift in supposed shift in strategy today, in my opinion. I was talking to my son about his goals. I said, well, what is, what is your goal? Do you want to play Division One baseball? Do you want to play Major League Baseball? But do you want to, you want to do the Division One and then do Major League Baseball? And I said, if Division One is what you want, make that your first goal. And then the second you achieve that goal, then write down the goal of how you're going to play in the Major Leagues. Um, because you always need your next goal. But everyone who Everyone who I've ever known that's that's truly successful has several goals. Some are short, some are medium term, some are long term goals, and you can have them all written down at once. But a company like Ripple is no different. You you've got you've got certain goals that are short term goals. You got certain goals that are the mid term goals. Certain are the di world reserve digital currency mid to long term goal. Okay, but you have all of these goals. But when I saw this tweet right here from Shish Burla, I was I was looking at this and I was like, OK, so they've chosen on their first the, the this little shift in strategy is on the lead up to their IPO. They've chose this strategy as their as their leading up to IPO OGO, the way that they need to focus. Because remember, what do you do in an IPO? You have IPO roadshows. You have to have something that's nice and simple that's here in the now that you can sell. You might not be able to as successfully sell to a group of potential investors. And again, this is just me talking, folks. This is just my ideas running around in my head. Would it be easier for you to go in front of an, a group of investors when, let's say, for example, a Goldman Sachs is underwriting your stock and you're doing a roadshow? Would it be more realistic for a group of traditional investors for you to get up there and to say, hey, we believe that that's where payment growth is in the future. Think MasterCard, think Visa. Both companies are very successful and focus on low value payments. And guess what? We're doing it right now. Is that the pitch or is the pitch to those investors? Hey, um, we're going to take over Swift entirely. OK, what do you think would be more and more believable to a group of traditional investors here and now? Not not trying to sell them on what you're going to do in the next five years or 10 years or whatever, but selling them on what you're doing, telling them what you're doing now and how you think it's going to grow even more. That is what I think you would do in the lead up to an IPO, which makes sense. That doesn't mean that all of the things that you've heard Riffle talk about are all of a sudden shelved. I think far and away, no way, no how. All of those things are very, very involved right now. But that doesn't mean that that's what you would use as your flag to carry leading up to IPO. And so that's what I think this is. What, what is more marketable to your investors as you lead up to IPO than comparing something to MasterCard and Visa, what you're doing? Nothing is the answer. Actually, only one thing would be comparable, and that is if you were selling something like Coca-Cola. That's more marketable than MasterCard and Visa. But soft drinks is not Ripple's product. And, but I, I, I brought this up because I tweeted this out yesterday. Now, that's what I call adoption. Coca-Cola is now paid for in Bitcoin. A partnership has been established between CentraPay and Coca-Cola. I'm a till that will allow Bitcoin payments on vending machines. That's pretty much when you know you are about to have some serious adoption when Coca-Cola is in play. Okay, X-Men XRP sent me this. Galaxy Digital and Back unveiled joint trading and custody service for institutional investors. Um, the new partnership provides secure and efficient means of buying, selling, and storing Bitcoin for asset managers and institutional investors seeking exposure to digital assets. Okay, now moving along, we're about to get into some interesting things. You, and this now, I, I told you what I think Ripple's doing in this short run. 
but let's go back to the big picture because the big picture is right in front of our face. Now, it, some people may think it's a longer term thing. I think it's a much, much shorter term thing than people believe. But let's, I want to show you, this is XRP Crypto Wolf, U.S.'s new top federal bank regulator, Brian Brooks, talks about cryptocurrency, state licenses, and DeFi. Brian Brooks, OCC, said a digital dollar, which he's advocated in the past, is something that should be developed by the U.S. government with private entities. And this is Brian Brooks talking. Listen to this. For scale businesses. And so my thinking is, uh, on, the, on the charter issue, is that there are certain kinds of companies that are engaged in inherently borderless activities. Payments are an example. Crypto is an example, uh, and there are, there are other examples out there as well. And if that's the case, and if those are scale businesses, then my question is, doesn't Lincoln's insight apply to them the same way it applies to traditional depository institutions? If they're engaged in a financial business and they're doing it across state lines, wouldn't it be important for my agency to create a national license uh, that, that allows them to do that business on a national basis, subject to the same kinds of oversight and supervision that traditional banks are, are subject to? That's kind of the thinking. Now, in terms of our authority and who's going to support this and who's going to initially oppose it, like with any change, you know, there are always early adopters and late adopters. So I think we know that, and we know that there will be people who are skeptical and critical in the early days, and we're open to that feedback. But here's where the authority comes from. Let me just start with that. The authority comes from the idea that um, the controller of the currency, currently me, gets to issue bank charters. That's a, that's a power that's vested in this, this office that I occupy. And the definition of a bank has for many, many years been quite broad. OCC regulations that go back at least 20 years say that a bank is anything that engages in lending, payments, or deposit taking. Some people have mistakenly assumed that the or in that phrase is an and, right? Because they can't conceive of a bank that doesn't take deposits. And yet we've had banks that are not significant depositories for a long time. We have trust banks. We have credit card banks and other monoline banks that don't do that. So I begin with the fact that anything that's engaged in one of those three activities under our longstanding regulations can be a bank. So then the question is, who are the companies? What are the activities being conducted that fall into those categories that might benefit from banking from a banking charter? I'm really that is interesting because I believe. That's what I think is ha is going to happen with PolySign. That PolySign. That's what my gut is: is that PolySign is going to be a large holder of this XRP escrow, and it might be turned into some sort of a bank, a custody bank of some sort. Now, listen to what this is: the CEO of R3. This is from XRP Yo-Yo. Listen to what he says. How businesses think about their processes, which creates an opportunity uh, for R3 with its quarter platform. David, I wanted to ask you about who benefits from this, because I know Facebook has clearly been pushing forward with digital payments, but it had a few challenges after the, the trust issue cropped up because of the privacy uh, invasions. But what happens next? Is it going to be private companies or public companies, or is it going to be central banks that step up to the challenge on digital assets? I actually think it ends up being a private-public partnership, but clearly not just with what Facebook has going on, but what we're seeing out of China is causing central banks around the globe to reconsider, you know, paper money. And uh, certainly the technologies exist today uh, to really uh, enhance the way the monetary system works. Early in this crisis, I wrote a little piece about the uh, idea when, when the Trump administration was talking about pushing checks out uh, for folks to spend to help with the economy. And the way programmable money works today, it's instantaneous and it can be directed to be spent. And if you think about how archaic sending a paper check through the mail to someone who you hope receives it and then you hope spend it, all those things need to be questioned. And the technology exists today to make those payments instantly and say spend them positively towards encouraging economic growth within X number of days or disappears. You know, that's a powerful uh, way to think about about money. And I think uh, getting back to Facebook, I had previously commented that I didn't think it was very well thought out because they talked about linking it to a basket of currencies and being an ex FX person. It made no sense to me. I think they've come a long way in their thinking. And, and clearly, if you're a central bank uh, or a government, you don't want to lose control uh, of your money. But I think the solution is central banks working uh, with private companies 
uh, to come up with a new type of money. Well, that's interesting on two fronts. One thing he mentioned in there that I thought was fascinating is programmable money. Imagine imagine that money, a digital currency being dropped into these digital wallets. And if you don't spend it, in a, it's programmable. So if you don't spend it in a in a, in a certain period of time, it, it poof disappears because it's programmable. That is amazing. But, he, but the other important thing he said is that he thinks private companies are going to be working with governments. Who do you think? Who's been doing this longer than anybody? Ask yourself that question. Who's been working on this longer than anybody? What company has been working with governments from day one of all of this? One, folks, it's Ripple. All right. CR at Equity Pool sent me this. This morning I did a video on who the major holders of XRP are. And, and this guy brought this to my attention. I had shown this a long time ago, but some of you haven't seen it yet. It was a question on Quora. Is it, is it really true that David Schwartz sold all his XRP coins in recent days? If yes, why? David Schwartz answered this back uh, August 15th, 2019. No, it's not true. I still hold a significant fraction of all the XRP I've ever held. Unlike Jed McCaleb, Arthur Brito, and Chris Larson, I did not participate in the original division. Well, that answer right there tells me, uh, in, if you remember my little uh, numbers I was showing, these guys like McCaleb and Chris Larson, we know had four, uh, five, five to six billion. So that means Arthur Brito must have gotten somewhere in the five, six billion range as well. David Schwartz is saying right here that he did not, he was not there when they split up. So he didn't get near what these guys did if he got anything at all. So that's an interesting thing right there in itself. I'm not going to read through all the rest of that. Now, let's go back to the big picture, folks. You don't need to stay. It, it, it's important in the lead up to an IPO that Ripple does what they're going to do, but that doesn't mean that you and me get to lose focus on what is really going on in this. Leonidas had tweeted this out. Don't forget the company Everest, um, owned by NTT Data. Everest has done several projects with Ripple, considers it one of the most important companies in blockchain DLT. If any company would like to start a blockchain and DLT practice nowadays, those would be the guys that they would like to partner with. And I want to play you. He's got on his XRPArcade.com, which is a very thorough site on Ripple and XRP if you haven't visited. He's got some videos and some a, a write-up. This is the chart. Remember, I'll go to that in a second. But he, I wanted to show you this clip. This is one of the guys from Everest that's talking about working with Ripple. Ever. That's 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 mainly 99% uh, of that money goes to the renewal of the mainframe licenses. Okay. So with blockchain, we can go from something like this into this, and you'll have to trust me on this one. Okay, I don't have the time to explain every single detail on why this is so simple. Probably I'm oversimplifying it. So you believe me more, okay? Notice but trust right me, there. I mean, if you want to have a conversation on why we are going from this to this, uh, I will sit down with you and uh, properly explain, okay? The most important thing here to understand is that we go from a centralized network with multiple versions of the truth where I have to trust people and which is highly error prone to something that is decentralized and distributed. That means that the information is shared between the multiple participants of the use case and there is no central regulator that says you are right and you are wrong. Everyone has the same version of the truth and that's something that I have repeated many times because it's very important and that version of the truth might be right for all or wrong for all but we will never have to discuss about there being different versions. We don't have to trust in people, we can trust in cryptography, I like that. And we can trust in consensus algorithms, which up until today are highly secure. You can see there are some of our partners and the blockchain and DLT platforms that uh, our technology team have mastered already. Okay, uh, Some of you might know some of those names, uh, for those of you that you don't. Uh, basically, those are the most important companies in the blockchain and DLT space. If Did you hear that? The most important companies. <laughs> anyone, if any company would like to start a blockchain and DLT practice nowadays, those would be the guys 
that they would like to partner with. This is what we are doing, okay, in Everett, Ripple, in the Porter. blockchain for banking space. Again, there's a lot of information in this slide. If you want. Okay, anyway, these guys have been working with Ripple. Now, it all goes back to this, folks, and the official father of the Digital Asset Investor channel he told me that the day that I did the video that included this slide, now I don't want to give credit here, the first person that I know that ever came out with this slide or found it is Love for Crypto. So if you don't subscribe to Love for Crypto's YouTube channel, go do it. If you don't follow Love for Crypto on Twitter, go do it. That, that guy's the one that, that found this. And here it is. It's all laid out for you, folks. 2017 to 2020, Ripple becomes the standard for international money transfers between banks. ILP becomes standard protocol for connecting banks, cash ledgers as a part of Ripple software. 2020 to 2025, just think interoperability, folks, because that's what all of this is. Uh, any, really, 2020 to 2030 is all about interoperability. And you go down here and you can see everybody that's involved in, with Hyperledger is in the game. BNY Mellon, IBM, who's partnered with Stellar. All these guys are in the game, folks. Then if you go down, the last slide, of course, is the favorite. Money Networks, XRP Ledgers at the very center of it all. Then the platforms are here. Blockchains and DLTs, capital markets, trade finance, Internet of Things, play, payment platforms. You see the picture, folks? My son might be able to draw this. In fact, I think that the coup de grace for me would be if I got my son to draw this picture, he might be really angry at me for even trying. He would tell, I know he's going to tell me it's too hard, but I'm going to see if I can get him to do it on a big poster board or something. Okay. And I think that I am Legion summed it up perfectly here. Time will tell. I think time will show that SBI, R3, Ripple, Accenture, NTT, Data, Everest, SIA, and others will make XRP fuel the internet of value. And finally, I thought this great Gatsby, he said it well here. When you see a post saying, ha ha, CBDCs will replace XRP, told you guys, just for clarification, everyone, CBDCs and XRP are the perfect match. It's not one or the other. China doesn't want stable coins tied to USD. That is the entire point, folks. I am the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe and hit the like button and tell your friends and family. China does not want stable coins tied to USD. That is the entire point, folks. Thanks for listening.